Have you ever printed something out of TPU and thought to yourself, I need more flex? You can mess with slicer settings, you can use a softer material, but also, why not design the model around having more flex? Here are some options for maximizing your squish. But at the end, I want to pose a question to see if we can develop this idea a little bit further. We've been messing with TPU a lot on the channel recently. And on top of that, I've been printing a lot of TPU just personally. All of these flexible materials got me thinking though. When we talk about 3D printed parts, we often focus on what can we do to make this the strongest part? How can we make my thing the strongest thing? But when it comes to TPU, we talk about the opposite. Everybody wants to get that squish. But how do you get all that flexibility? Well, I think I've narrowed down a couple of good strategies that I'm gonna talk to you about today. Your material, your perimeters and infill density, as well as the infill pattern. And then also designing for the application are the three things I wanna focus on a little bit. Between these options I've narrowed down, I can guarantee you're gonna get the most flex for your lettuce. You like that? All right, starting with the material that you're using. There's different grades, different levels of hardness for your TPU. We've spoken about it in another video, I'll link it. But the quick version is 95A is kind of the standard TPU that most people would use. There's different hardnesses of TPU and as such, an easy shortcut is get a softer material, then you'll have more flex. A few weeks ago, I decided I was gonna pick up some 90A durometer TPU from Polymaker. This is their Polyflex stuff and it is flexy, boy. I decided to go down the rabbit hole with this stuff a little bit more because I've never used any TPU outside of the standard 95A. For the TPU testing, we're gonna be comparing these nacho testers because that's what we do here. My default printing profile uses gyroid infill at 15% density and three perimeters. This is what I was gonna be using for all of my controlled tests. And then we would just change one variable at a time from there. I started by printing one of these nacho testers using the 90A TPU from Polymaker. And next to that, I had another one printing out of this 95A TPU from Overture. Having never used the 90A stuff, I had no idea what to do for the print settings. So I just decided to send it using the generic 95A settings on Orca Slicer, and we'll just see what happens. The machine seemed to be laying down product consistently, and the finish actually looked really good. Luckily, it began surprisingly well. The problem then came when the model got to about 80%, and it stopped extruding. From what I've heard about TPU, I know if you don't have it dried properly, this is something that can happen. So even though this stuff was straight out of the bag, I decided to throw it in the dryer just to make sure that it was fully cooked. With the moisture variable eliminated, I moved on to doing another print. This time, I dropped the speed down a little bit though. With TPU being super soft, you often want to slow down the speeds so it doesn't get wrapped around the extruder gears or get jammed up in the tool head or anything goofy like that. So I went ahead and cut all my speeds in half. That failed, so I cut all my speeds in half again. That one failed even worse, so I decided to look at what I was left with across all of these tests to try and see what was going on. From what I could tell, it looked like maybe the overhangs were causing the issues. In one case, it looked like the filament was pretty burnt at an overhang, indicating that it might be trying to fail at that point, but it managed to pull through. But each of these prints did fail due to a lack of extrusion, not necessarily a nozzle clog or something like that. Though the lack of extrusion was causing the nozzle to clog. You get, you get what I mean. You know what I mean. Comment below if you don't get what I mean. But basically what was happening was the filament was getting too hot inside of the hot end or inside of the extruder. As such, the extrusion couldn't be controlled correctly because the melt zone was no longer inside of a window that was acceptable. The material may have softened beyond what would be the regular melt zone. So that was causing our extrusion issues. 
In both models, the overhangs in the upper section of the model was the point of failure, so I jumped into the slicer to see what I could see. This is when I noticed a little checkbox called slow down for overhangs. This was a problem because if we were having trouble with overhangs and the printer was slowing down its tool head movements during overhangs, well then that filament's spending a little bit more time in the melt zone, thus causing it to melt too much, maybe causing nozzle clogs. See, the areas with the faster extrusions and the faster tool head movements, those weren't any issues. But the areas that had a lot of retractions back to back to back, or the areas that had overhangs with slower tool head travels, those ones were causing some issues. This led me to the conclusion that the softer stuff was more susceptible to heat, maybe, than the 95A. And by slowing down the speeds, it actually made it much, much worse. So I turned off the overhang slowdown button and sent it for another go. Amazingly, the thing printed and the overhangs looked way better than they ever had. Great, so we got that problem whipped. Now we can finally do some comparisons between a 90A and a 95A nacho tester, three perimeters, 15% gyroid infill. Let's take a look. Obviously the 90A flexes quite a bit more and I'll be sure to show plenty of footage as the video goes on trying to display how much more it flexes because you can't actually hold it right now. I I can hold it, but you can't. So you'll just have to take my word. Still, it's pretty interesting that this stuff actually didn't need any special print settings other than generic bamboo settings, aside from that overhang slowdown deal that was shut off. Now that you saw how difficult it was for me to print this stuff, if you want to buy some of this 90A Polyflex material, uh, check the link in the description and you can have a tough time like I did. Or maybe you won't have a tough time and you can tell me what I've done wrong. If you do get some, I would recommend keeping the print speeds faster instead of slower, which is kind of counterintuitive from what I know about TPU. What settings do you print your flexibles at? And also, what machines are you printing them on? Because I hear a lot of people struggle using bamboo machines with flexibles. To that end, what flexibles are you using? like in terms of softness and durometer rating and stuff. How low can you go, baby? Let me know in the comments. So we have this free Patreon page. I don't know if it's always gonna be free, but it's a good way to connect, like one-on-one -on -one and have discussions with other people. Whenever we do these things, I'm gonna open up our Patreon page. I'll make a discussion so we can all kind of get some input out there. But if you join our Patreon page, I'll send you a message. So that'll give you the ability to direct message me if you'd like. That's just gonna be the good platform, I think, to continue to build the community for those that want it. So head on over to our Patreon page if you wanna talk to me more directly. So of course, material, that's a big one. Everybody realizes that softer material is gonna make a more flexible part. Great, we've knocked that out. The other big thing you can do to control your model's flexibility characteristics is mess with your perimeters and your infill. Talking about perimeters and infill is something we've done quite a bit of on this channel. We have spent a good amount of time crushing these K-testers and varying the infill density and the perimeters. Basically, the thing that we've learned is it's a fairly dynamic relationship between just those two settings. If you want to use flexibility to your advantage and retain your strength at the same time, you can lower your infill density but still keep the perimeters as thick as you need them to be. So your model still will be structurally sound, but it will have a degree of yield to it without that internal structure. If you don't want your thing to yield at all, then using the infill with your outer shells together is going to create a lot more structural rigidity overall. These things need to be tuned together and independently to really optimize whatever you're trying to do to suit your application, but there is a lot of margin for optimization just inside of these two settings alone. But if you're really trying to step up your flexibility game using just slicer settings, the infill pattern is the big one. Something as simple as changing your infill pattern can make your model go from this to this.
For this test, we're going to compare my daily driver infill, the good old gyroid, to one that I've never even used, the concentric infill. Concentric infill just follows the shape of your shells and kind of does circles that aren't connected to each other, concentric inside of your model. It appears to be more of an infill that's used to hold up the rest of the part while it's printing instead of provide any notable internal structure. If there wasn't any infill inside the structure at all, your model would have a hard time building each layer and stacking. Everything would effectively be printing as an overhang if it wasn't straight up and down because it wouldn't have the infill structure to rely on when printing those angles. And your surfaces and overhangs will look super dumb. But maybe we try that. Next video. So it turns out you can print with no infill and get pretty good results. I was wrong, but I said it before you did. With the concentric infill, none of the internal structure really connects to itself. None of it's tied together. So you don't really get any XY strength. The layers are still stacked in the Z direction, so you get a lot of the strength of the infill in the Z direction. But since there's no lateral stability and nothing connecting it in the XY, it tends to yield a lot better than your standard infill anyway, even in the Z direction. I also tried printing one with the Hilbert curve because that's kind of an unconstrained infill as well. It doesn't connect to itself, but it's mostly just like corners like the whole infill is just corners and a corner is technically a pretty strong structure even if it's not connected to anything else as a result this one didn't really do anything special now the evolution of this idea is finding a way to optimize the model to make it even more squishy no slicer settings no material differences just the model i'm a big fan of using cad to optimize the model and do as much of the heavy lifting in the base design of the model. That way the slicer has less of a say, and then you can just send it without having to worry about what settings you use or how many perimeters we used on that last time, and blah, 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 blah. And then when I share these files with you, it doesn't really matter what settings you use because the model's been optimized to simply print, and it's not dependent on the slicer settings. When talking about making a model stronger in a specific area, you can employ the use of something called microstructures. And I first saw this on Slant3D's channel, so definitely not my idea that I came up with. But you should check out Slant3D because there's some smart individuals doing some clever things. But back to the microstructures. So these are little features that you design into your CAD model that trick the slicer into depositing more material in a certain area of your choosing. So that makes that specific area stronger. In the case of this zigzag nut bolt fidget thing that I made, I wanted the nut to be a bit heavier so it would glide across the threads a little bit easier. Using these microstructures is actually a good way to also put more material into your model. By adding these little tiny holes around the outside that would normally be infill, it's actually going to make the slicer print walls there instead, effectively making this a solid piece with zero infill because it's got 100% perimeters. Similarly, using TPU, I printed out this bat cone bat trap thing for a buddy of mine that owns a pest control business. Initially, I printed this part out of PLA and PETG, but my buddy needed the flange to be flexible in order to mount this in the goofy spaces that he might need to. PETG PLA wasn't going to work for that. The reason why I didn't want to print it all in TPU was because the screw holes were the only things holding it on to where it's being mounted. I wasn't certain that the screw holes were gonna be strong enough if it could just be ripped off of the building. But that's when the light bulb went on. I figured I can add some more holes around the screw hole like I did before, and that'll add a lot more material around the screw holes, making that part of the model way stronger than the rest of it. So this means the model has all the strength where I need it. I don't have to worry about how many perimeters I'm doing and what my infill percentage is and the model will just print in a year when I print it and I've already forgotten what I need to do. No need to set up shape modifiers in the slicer. No need for special slicing just in this area of the model. None of that. 
So this is just like a quick glimpse into the world of using microstructures to trick the slicer into doing things that we want it to do. There's a lot more to cover and I'd like to dive into it more, so let me know if you'd like to see that. But all of this leads me to my final question. Is there a way to design a model in CAD in such a way that we can trick the slicer into making the model weaker? Can we find a way to have the slicer generate less material in certain areas of the model to have it yield more, thus making the ultimate squishy model out of TPU? Why don't you pop a comment down below, or better yet, hop on over to our free Patreon. It's free, it doesn't cost you anything. All you gotta do is join, and then you can like, let me know what you think about stuff. If you want to try your luck using the 90A Polyflex Polymaker stuff that we used in this video, good luck to you. But I'll have a link in the description if you're feeling brave enough. And then let me know if you have more success with it, because I really don't know what I'm going to do with the rest of this roll. I guess I'll keep trying. Bye.